in the world that have stories like the old uh, Nordic countries, stories of these giant, giant human-like creatures, strange monsters and beasts. And uh, yeah, the old Viking lands, that's one of those places, but it's not the only place. And another place that has stories like that is right here, right down the road, a place called Dead Man's Hole. If you ever go out to Dead Man's Hole, you better not go at night. There's things out there in them old woods make a grown man die of fright. There's things that walk, things that fly, things that creep along on the ground. And they say that a big old hairy beast gets up and he walks around. But I couldn't believe it. I just had to find out for myself, couldn't conceive it. I never would listen to nobody else, I couldn't believe it. Oh, I just had to find out for myself, there's some things in this world you can't explain. Now, Edward and Charles, they were two men from Julian, and they took their mules all the way out, way past Warner Springs, out by Warner Warner Stage House, and you can drive out there yourself nowadays, but they had taken their mules out there in 1888 to go hunting. They lived here in Julian, but they would go out hunting out in that wilderness sometimes. But on this particular day in 1888, they were out there, and they hadn't found anything. Now, Charles, he was, he was clean-shaven. He was, uh, you know, kind of a soft-spoken man. He said, boy, Edward, it certainly is a, it's a poor moon upon this hunting day today. Now, Edward, he was kind of had kind of a gruff voice. He had a big, bushy mustache. He looked like Sam Elliott from The Big Lebowski, <laughs> the narrator. And he said, you're right about that, Charles. Dang poor hunt today. They're, they've been looking out all day. It was getting to afternoon time. They hadn't found a, a squirrel, a rabbit, nothing out there. Now, Edward, he said, I'm sure it must be them blasting down in the mines back home in Julian, scared off all the critters. Charles, he said, yes, that's quite a distinct possibility. Charles said, man, what do you think? Shall we pack up our mules? Shall we head on back home to Julian? Edward said, I ain't heading home empty-handed. This is our home, Charles. This is our home. We can't go back. We got to feed our families. We got to take care of them. We got to find them. And he kind of looked around. There's got to be somewhere we can find a critter. And, and he looked all around. Their mules were drinking from a, a spring right there. He looked around and then he saw, kind of off in the distance, the entrance to a dark canyon. He said, look at that. You can barely see inside that canyon. Dark, full of brush and sticks and rocks. And Edward, he said, look at that there canyon over there. I bet there's some kind of critter in there. I bet you would find a big buck deer in that canyon. But Charles, he said, well, are you sure? It's, it's, it's going to be getting dark soon. It was winter time. It's going to be getting dark soon. Edward said, well, don't you worry. We don't have to go all the way back to Julian. Look at there in the sand. Look, at, You can see the tracks from the, the stagecoach. The stagecoach runs through here right past this spring. I'm sure just down the road, about four miles, it's uh, Warner Ranch House is down there. We'll spend the night there. We don't have to go all the way back to Julian. It's worth spending an extra night away from home if we can bring some meat back. This is our home. We've got to take care of our families. Well, Charles, he kind of didn't want to go into that creepy dark, eerie canyon, but uh, he went, he was kind of a follower, Edward was kind of a leader, so they both went into that canyon together. Now they both, they shouldered their guns, get ready to, get ready to shoot anything they see, they're thinking maybe they'll find them, at least some couple of rabbits or something. And so they sort of walked into that canyon, and as soon as they got in between those tall, steep canyon walls, they realized they almost entirely blocked out the light of the sun. It was almost like nighttime in that canyon. They're walking and they're climbing over these boulders and having to step over all these fallen trunks who looked like no, no human had ever been down in that canyon before. And they're walking deeper and deeper in. And they got their guns at the ready. And then they heard, a, heard something moving in the brush way up down the head of, down in the canyon. Edward, he said, hang on, Charles, let me, let me get up on these rocks, see if I can catch it. Catch a glimpse of what that is. Edward, he climbed up on the rocks on the wall of the canyon. He climbed up there and he looked down, way down that dark canyon. Sure enough, something was moving, but it was moving fast down that canyon. 
He looked, he said, it's a bear. Charles, it's a bear down there. Oh, what a bitch gotta be. Seven foot tall, Charles. Now that bear, it was moving fast. It was almost running through the canyon, climbing, crawling all over the rocks and trunks. And so Edward, he took up his gun. He said, if, if I don't shoot that thing quick, it's gonna get away. Picked up his gun and he shoots. Now he didn't hit it. But that critter turned, stopped it, and looked toward him. And when it turned its ugly head, Edward and Charles, they both just gasped. Because that thing's face looked human. That thing let out a roar and went running through the canyon. So Edward and Charles, they were running after it. They're running and they're climbing over the things. And pretty soon that thing has started to climb up the walls, just like a mountain climber, climbing up those walls, up toward a dark fissure in the rock, looked like a cave or something. And it's climbing up. And Ed, Charles, he said, we can't let it get away. Charles, he points his gun. And That thing let out a terrible yell, some kind of howl, yell, yowl, something they'd never heard before, and it went falling off the rocks, and it tumbled, it smack, it hit the ground with a sickening thud. And Charles and Edward, they, they walked up to that thing to see what it was that they'd shot. Edward said, good shot, Charles. They walked up and they looked at it, there it was lying there. They got up, and, you know, Edward, he pulled out his hanky, he said, oh, the stink on this thing, look at that. Charles said, yes, it certainly gives off quite the odor. And they got up there and they said, what is that thing? Edward, he said, it ain't a bear. I mean, look at that face. Charles, he said, yes, it looks, looks almost human, except for all the hair covering its body. That could be a man. Edward said, yeah, except for, look at them chompers there. It had these two long fangs sticking out of its ugly mouth. Now, Edward, he kind of poked it with his with his boots, and look at the size of the feet on that thing, too. I've never seen a critter like that. Charles said, well, I'm not planning on feeding that thing to my family. Huh. Edward yeah. said, well, no, I ain't planning on it either. And at that moment, Charles, he started to put two and two together, that critter, those fangs, the big feet, the big claws on its hands. And he said, wait a second. This thing with the claws, it's some kind of predator. Edward, he said, Edward, you know what that spring was back there by the entrance of the canyon? That's Dead Man's Hole. And when he said that, they both kind of gasped because they'd heard the stories of Dead Man's Hole down the road. Anyone in Julian in 1888 knew about Dead Man's Hole down by Warner Ranch House. It was a natural spring. They called it Dead Man's Hole because well, they found a lot of dead people nearby there. People with their necks wrung, people who'd been strangled, murdered down by the hole. It first got its name when a stage driver was riding past there and he stopped and he bent over to drink from that spring and then he screamed when he saw a human face floating just under the surface of the water, floating face up, all bloated and ugly. And that wasn't the, the last victim they found. They found several other people all strangled to death. They even found a businessman from San Francisco strangled down by a dead man's hole. And the strange thing was he had a gold pocket watch and he had bills he had billfolds of money in his pockets and nobody had taken the money or taken the watch. They just killed him. That was when Edward, he said, Charles, you reckon that thing, that's, that's what's been killing them people? And they looked up at that cave, up at that dark fissure in the rock. Edward said, Charles, why don't we go, let's go take a look. Let's see what, that must be that thing's home. Charles said, <laughs> Edward, I don't think that's a great idea. <laughs> Edward, he said, come on. Well, don't you think we, what if there's some belongings of the victims of the people that's been killed? And don't you think we owe it to all those poor people been killed out here at Dead Man's Hole? Let's go take a look. So they did. They climbed up the rocks all the way up to that cave. They walked in, and then both of them had to take out their hankies to cover their mouths. It's just this terrible stink in there. They walked into the cave, their eyes adjusted to the light. They walked in there, and as they walked in, they saw a pile of bones, hundreds of bones all piled up at the entrance, stained with blood. Now, some of them were sheep and deer bones, animal bones, but then they recognized some human femurs and rib cages in there among all the bones. And they walked deeper into the cave, and they saw a big old pile of leaves covered in dirt and filth. That must have been that critter's bed. And then Charles, he said in a really high voice, Edward... Take a look over here. Edward walked over. There was a ledge running along the edge of that cave and lined up on that ledge like eight little trophies were eight white 
human skulls all grinning back at him. Edward, he looked at Charles, he said, you know what, Charles, that thing, it might have others, it might have a, a mate, it might have children, pups, there might be other males out there too. Charles said, yes, and when they find their patriarch lion down there where we shot him, Edward said, Charles, you know, maybe you were right to be a little cautious. Maybe it's time to head back to Julian, or at least down to Warner Ranch House. Charles, he said, I think you're right too, because they both realized that this was their home, but it wasn't just their home. That critter thought it was their, its home too. And Charles and Edwards and humans like them, they weren't the only ones who needed to go out and hunt and feed in those mountains. But I couldn't believe it. I just had to find out for myself. I couldn't conceive it. I never would have listened to nobody else. I couldn't believe it. I just had to find out for myself. There's some things in them woods you just can't explain. Now that story of Charles and Edward, that story was printed in the San Diego Union paper in 1888. It was printed, now later on the paper said part of it was an April Fool's joke, but we don't know what part. Maybe the whole thing was made up. Maybe they just made up the part about them shooting the critter. But that's not the only story about large, tall, hairy, humanoid-like creatures like that around here in this whole area. And we'll tell you more about some other things that our storytelling group is doing about another legend of a long, large, hairy humanoid critter that might still be lurking somewhere out in those woods near here. That's the tale of Dead Man's Hole. Yeah.